Hello and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Hairlift and with me today are my good friends Manny Cruz and Matt Hunter. Say hi guys. Hi. You know what? When I see the title of this cartoon Hairlift, it's actually talking about what happened to me about nine years ago when I went bald. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching that one. You said it. Not Literally, me. my hair lifted off my head. But I'm, I'll be here all week, folks. Try the veal. <laughs> so, as mentioned, this is for Hair Lift, released on the 20th of December 1952. It's the 667th in the series and it's directed by Frizz Freeling. You can find this newly restored and it looks beautiful, by the way, on the Bugs Bunny 80th Blu ray set, and I have a link below. I can't show you the full cartoon here. YouTube will just block it. That's why you cannot see this short on YouTube at all. You'll have to find another avenue to do it. But in this short, in case you haven't seen it, and I actually didn't see it until we came on this set, you see your enemy Sam is robbing banks, seemingly as usual, but anyway. And he decides to escape by going to the airport, and he hijacks a plane, which has Bugs Bunny in it. Bugs tries to fly it, and, well, yeah, he, he doesn't know how to fly this. But anyway... <laughs> it's a really bizarre cartoon, but in a good way. I really like this one. It's one of those new little gems that I seemingly have discovered now, which is good. Are you crazy engine pilot? I'll have your license revoked! Trivia. Well, there's actually three. The first one is that the title itself is a play on the term airlift. You know, it's an airport term. It should be pretty apparent, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. I also wanted to point out when this short was made, this would have been made probably early 1951. Even though this was released towards the end of 52, I have since discovered that there was a massive backlog. That's why you had shorts that were made all the way in 1951 were still being released in not only 52, but also 53 as well. But around that time, there was the plane called the Spruce Goose, which was this massive plane that Howard Hughes tried to, of course, make it into a viable thing. And it was only flown once. In fact, if you've seen the Martin Scorsese film, The Aviator, which is a great film, by the way, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, you'll get an idea of what it's all about. But yeah, this plane seemingly is a play on that. But Matt, the third bit of trivia was what you noticed in the newspaper article we see in the beginning. Yes. And whenever you're watching one of these newly restored Looney Tunes, it, it always amazes me that now you can read the newsprint on whenever they show a newspaper or a sign or something like that. And the headline that kind of is the exposition for the cartoon, which says giant plane ready for test flight and world's largest plane. If you look beyond the headline, they actually took clip outs from the in-studio newspaper that I believe was called the Warner Club News. And it was usually just kind of news bites about the, the people at the studio. There's a bit that you can read that says ham was well-known in the animated cartoon business since he was one of the pioneer animators. He worked with this studio on the very first picture we ever made called Sinking in the Bathtub back in 1930. His many friends grieve his passing. And I thought, huh, now who could that be? Well, Ham was Roland Hamilton. He was an animator for those early Bosco cartoons. Obviously, that was a, an obituary for him in the studio newspaper, and he died in 1951. So this would have been a fairly recent clip when this cartoon was being made. They just clipped it out of the studio newspaper and just kind of put text in there. So I thought that was really cool. And it's always fascinating just to see these newspaper things, as you mentioned, in, in these new restorations. And look, they were certainly not meant to be shown to audiences in a way that's like, okay, we're going to pause it here so you guys can read it. It's just there to fill the page, basically. We're just there to see the headline. Yeah. But it's still interesting for us future generations that have the ability to pause these things to actually have a look, you know, because we've got no lives, of course, so we have to look at this sort of stuff, right? But yeah, as I mentioned, I hadn't seen this one before, and I've seen this for the first time, and I've got to say, this one is actually a really good short. It's a nice, solid Bugs Bunny, you said to me, Sam short. It's nothing, I guess spectacular but it's it's solid it's great because Manny you were saying to me before we recorded you were in the same boat you never really saw this one when I started getting into this hobby 20 years ago I would record the cartoons off a of Cartoon Network and I recall recording this one and then I never got around to seeing it but yeah after all these years this is probably the first time that I sat and watched it from beginning to end certain scenes I have seen before or I've seen like a reference to them but uh, yeah, it's always cool discovering these to me new shorts even though 
I've been studying the history of these cartoons for so long. There's still a lot of cartoons that I haven't seen yet or some that I haven't seen in decades. And I want to thank our buddy, Matt, for recommending me watching the Warner Brothers shorts in chronological order. It's taken me five years and I'm still not done. Not because I don't enjoy it, but it's just, you know, life gets in the way. And I'm still in 1940, so I won't be hitting this cartoon for a while unless I binge it. It's a little side note, but I think this is so strange, but yet kind of cool in some way that I have finally reached a cartoon or the cartoons of the lifespan of my parents. Because my father was born a month before this cartoon was released in November of 52. I've asked my dad before if he remembers watching Looney Tunes or other theatrical shorts and his memories. Like, yeah, he was at the perfect age, seven years old or when was the 1960s. So my dad was seven or eight years old when the Bugs Bunny show premiered on ABC. So he probably saw this one a fair amount back in the early television days of these shorts. I don't know. For me, it's like kind of a neat connection that I have to my parents because as I've told people before, like, yeah, I grew up watching these, all three of us, because we're around the same age. I'm the baby of the group. We all grew up watching these in the 90s, but having someone who existed when these cartoons were originally made, it's a cool connection. My dad was born in 54, and he grew up in West Texas, which is like one of the hottest parts of Texas, as if Texas needs the hottest part, because it's always hot. But he grew up in a house that didn't have air conditioning, which is even weirder to consider nowadays, but he remembered seeing some of these better cartoons when he was a little, little kid in theaters, but he really remembers being a teenager and going to the movie theater for an entire Saturday afternoon just to stay in the air conditioning because the movie theater had air conditioning. And he said, unfortunately, he remembers seeing cartoons in the theater, but by the time he was a teenager, he was seeing stuff like Paul J. Smith, Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and he said, he said, my God, were those awful, but they were better than being outside in the heat. They were something to watch before the main movie. And oftentimes they would show more than one movie and more than one cartoon. But he just said he, he specifically remembers seeing those later Woody Woodpeckers and being like, this sucks, but it's better than being outside. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> He loved the classic cartoons, which by then were on TV. Now, I saw this cartoon first in the 90s, and it was always on ABC. ABC had the Bugs Bunny and Tweety show. It was a continuation, of course, of the original network Looney Tunes shows that have been around forever, but they used the This Is It theme with, with the characters walking across the stage, and oh, what heights will hit on with the show, This Is It. They showed it with the titles cut off. They just put this little brief snippet of the Looney Tunes music with the title of the cartoon. They never showed the credits or anything, but I remember seeing this a fair amount on that show. And it may have been on a VHS tape I rented when I was a kid, although I can't confirm that, but that's where I saw it first. It's one of those where by this point, it was kind of rare to see Yosemite Sam actually as his original cowboy outlaw self, particularly outside of a Western setting. But here he just kind of seems to be in a town and He's just the 070 Sam, and he's robbing a bank. And he goes, and he takes over an airplane, and it just happens to be the same airplane that has run over Bugs Bunny's hole. And Bugs Bunny goes, and he's like, well, I think I'll take the 50-cent tour. Well, I think I'll take the 50-cent tour. And he goes up and, and looks at it. And Manny, where you may have seen clips of this before, was a cartoon made probably a decade after this called Devil's Feud Cake which the less said about it, the better. But it was actually redubbed and rescored, and they used footage of it, but they used the same gags. It's terrible. But this one is the original, and it's really funny. I love it. When I was watching this, the first thing I noticed is that when Sam's robbing the bank, the last national bank, by the way, so seemingly you said Sam has been pretty successful in robbing the first, second, and so on banks, but there's a gag that's very Tex Avery-esque and that's, you got the bank value in the front and he rubs off the numbers and leaves eight cents. And the similar gag was used in Thugs with Dirty Mugs where the, the bank teller rubs off the value of the actual bank amount. Yeah, after the Edward G. Robinson character, see, the see. bulldog, you know, he robs a bank, see? Yeah, killer <laughs> yeah. diller, yeah. Yeah, Tex Avery, see? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great one. 
And you wonder, though, that when Yosemite Sam does that, when he runs out of the bank and he rubs out the numbers and he changes it to eight cents, well, how did all that money he stole fit in one laundry bag? Like I say, you this before recording, he's just <laughs> that good. And see, I think Yosemite Sam is really playing four-dimensional chess here, and I'll, and I'll tell you why, because he's, mm. he's that good. Not only can he fit all that money in one sack, but he somehow knew that there'll be no security at this airport he's going through, and there's no ground crew to report him, and somehow this plane is pretty much ready to go, and he finds Bugs Bunny, who, yeah, he's not trained in flying a plane, but he somehow was able to figure it out. He's got a book that says Learn to Fly, and it's kind of like those books out there called Learn to Whatever for Dummies. (laughs) That would be the equivalent of that. And we never really know what kind of plane this is supposed to be, because at one point we see a bunch of windows on it. We see how big it is. So we're thinking, oh, it's an airliner. We think it's an airline plane. But then, no, we see in the background, we see a gun at one point. And then there's a gag where Bugs drops Yosemite Sam down a bomb chute. So this must be a military plane. But then, okay, if it's a military plane, then why does it need that much cavernous space? Is it a cargo military plane? I don't know. And where's the military? Like, wouldn't they be guarding it? Like, because at that time, the Cold War was starting up. So you'd think that they would have a hyped up security to look after it. Yeah. But anyway, cartoon logic. This was like the Cold War and the Korean War. Like, this was not a necessarily peacetime in the United States. Where's the security here? (laughs) <laughs> That's what's so good. Look, I hope people watching this don't think that we're ragging on this cartoon because of that. I think it's funnier because no. of that. And yeah, it's <laughs> cartoon logic. It's funny. We get almost a retread of the cartoon Falling Hair, where it was Bob Clampett's Bugs versus the Gremlin. We get a similar banana peel gag. And in this case, it's Yosemite Sam clinging to the outside of the emergency exit of the plane, you know, terrified. I love the idea that Yosemite Sam, after getting dropped down the bomb bay, then can actually swim the air back up to the plane. With that kind of whirly gig noise that Treg Brown adds, that's like the... <laughs> Some of the quotes at the beginning where once the plane runs over Bugs' home, it's like, you know, who parked this donut? Like, no, I can't say, I, I sound too there, on top of my house. Mmm, donut. Well, I was thinking, yeah, you stole that line right there. Just like, hey, who parked this donut over my hole? Hey, what's going on here? <laughs> who parked this donut <laughs> on top of my house? And speaking of bugs, because by proxy, since I'm the closest to New York, one scene in particular that jumps out to me, like the donut scene of when bugs is inside the plane. Oh, wow. Looks just like Grand Central. In looks Ada. like Grand Central with wings. Look yeah, like Grand Central yeah. with wings. Wow. It's the Grand Central Station with wings. Grand Central Terminal is the third busiest station in North America. Grand Central is number three. The one in Toronto, Canada, or as I better call it, America Junior, is two. And the one that I always take, Penn Station, New York. And I was actually telling Anthony a few days ago, if he goes to New York, do not call it Pennsylvania Station. Nobody calls it that. It's Penn Station. Make your life simple. Mm -hmm. And there's your New York lesson for today. (laughs) Now I got to get some donuts. (laughs) I have been to Grand Central Station, and it is like you go through that, and it's like, man, this place is huge. You go in in that main lobby with all the windows and everything. It's like, whoa, it's cavernous. It's huge. It's amazing. So, you know, bugs going through an airplane and comparing it to Grand Central Station, it must be a pretty impressive damn airplane. Yeah. yeah, and I'm wondering how, how on earth that thing gets even off the ground because they struggled with a spruce goose, which would have been the nearest equivalent, so that would have been interesting, but I guess that's why it's called a test flight that we're going to figure all that out, right? That was we mm-hmm. saw in the newspaper. Bugs, he's actually not even lying about he can't fly a plane. He's trying to do the right thing and tell Sam, I don't know how to fly a plane, and of course he just makes it, and then we've got the exaggeration of the control panel, which... I don't know if you guys have ever seen a cockpit. I know I have a few times. I know when I was younger, I got to actually see a cockpit while the plane was flying. And sadly, this is before the whole 9-11 thing. And when you were younger, you were allowed to sometimes go to the cockpit. And yeah, it was just just all these dials everywhere. And I love the exaggeration where Bugs is like, hmm, what do I do here? Yeah. Back when I was a kid, there used to be a program where 
if your parents wanted to send you to visit your grandparents or something on an airplane, they would make arrangements and it would be kind of a cool thing if you're a little kid. They'd give you kind of the the grand tour. They give you a little badge to put on your shirt that looked like a, an airline pilot's wings. And they would go and they'd take you in the cockpit. They would let you meet the pilot. They would show you all the cool gadgets and stuff like that. And that was obviously long before 9-11. You couldn't imagine even doing that for a kid nowadays, especially how did we get away with it back in the days when there were no cell phones? If something had gone wrong, these people are responsible for your child. How did that even go about? It's like, we turned out okay. There was a book that I had at home that I used to read all the time of that exact same situation you're describing, Matt, where it's like a little storybook for kids, but it was a girl or a boy. I think it was a boy. Sorry, that hopped on a plane. And he's like, oh, I'm excited to go on the plane. And I'm all by myself. And I'm a big boy, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, those days are long gone. And I missed that book. That was a really cool book I used to read. <laughs> well, and I was also going in the same state. I mean, even though Texas is a really big state, I was going maybe a one hour, maybe even 30 minute flight from my parents to my grandparents. Like my parents were, I lived in Fort Worth and my grandparents lived in Midland. And it was a then little airline called Southwest Airlines, which has now become a major airline like all the rest of them. But back then it was kind of laid back and nobody cared and it was in the same state. So, okay, something happened to me between Fort Worth and Midland. They probably could have figured it out pretty quick. Oh, it, definitely. But we see this exaggeration in this short where... Bugs, he starts up the plane, but once he figures it out, he goes over the local streets. I don't know how this plane even fit through there without any carnage, but, you know, we'll go with it. We'll go with it. And then when he finally figures it out, he just goes up like a rocket and it's like going all the way to the moon. I just thought, how powerful is this plane? And mind you, by this point, man had not gone to the moon yet. This is a decade, even more than a decade before space travel was even a thing so they i guess i had to imagine it i don't know i mean of course we've seen even back in 1948 with hair devil hair where of course bugs goes to space and meets marvin the martian for the first time on the moon as a matter of fact it's like bugs bunny went to space before any actual human being did exactly but oh, i like the effects there and how you're sending me sam he's just <laughs> thrown all over this plane with the gravity and all that, I like just like his reactions where he's like, what's this idiot doing? And then he finally confronts Bugs about it. And it's like, oh, you have no idea how to fly this properly, do you? <laughs> it's and notice cool. it doesn't throw Bugs around. Bugs is chill the whole time. He doesn't get thrown around. No. Only Yosemite Sam does. <laughs> and the madder he gets, the more bad things happen to him. And Bugs just kind of sits there and he's got his eyes kind of half closed. One point he's sitting there while, again, you're talking about the Jax gag in one of the pirate cartoons that Sam was in. He does the same thing. He's sitting there playing Jax on the floor of the plane, you know, nervously. Bugs is just there like, yeah, well, I'm not going to help you until you talk nice to me. I refuse to look up any more reference because you talk mean to me. Say you're sorry. Oh, no. Oh, that <laughs> scene killed me. That scene absolutely killed me where... And he's like, well, say you're sorry with sugar on it. <laughs> <laughs> with sugar on it. Yeah. <laughs> say you're sorry with sugar on it. No, no, never. Manny, is that what you say if people wrong you? Like if you have to get one of the students to say sorry to you, it's like, say sorry with sugar on it. Say sorry with sugar on it. Yeah, I, I should do that to my brother more often. You know, when he <laughs> acts like a jerk, you got to put with sugar on it. You know, that's a terrible Bugs impression. But <laughs> Bugs is being so, the only word I could think of is so petty there. I absolutely, I live for the pettiness of Mel Blanc's delivery mm. during that line. And, oh, so good. That was definitely probably the part of the cartoon that made me laugh the most. Yeah, and then we see Bugs just kick the book out where, funny how the doors open. I'm guessing the people who made this cartoon have no idea about air pressure in airplanes and how planes are supposed <laughs> yeah. to fly and all that. But again, cartoon logic, we go with it. It's or what you could say is, <laughs> I hope somebody got fired for that blunder. There we are. <laughs> there we and are. Actually, I mean, that is still pretty funny with Bugs being petty. But the scene that made me laugh the most was when Sam was like, give me the steering wheel. Give me that wheel. Well, if you insist. And Bugs just rips it out from the control panel and 
flings it out the window. And it's just, I don't know, maybe just how callous and how I don't give a beep Bugs is during that scene. And he just flings it out the window. It's just, oh, I thought that was, I don't know about you guys, but I found that hilarious. Oh, so did I. how he flung it. <laughs> and that robot pilot, like, okay, we got to get the robot pilot to help us out. And the other parts of helping, he just gets a parachute, just leaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At one point, Yosemite Sam delivers one of the greatest Mel Blanc Yosemite Sam lines of all time. Uh, and if it doesn't kill my voice to do it, but... Ooh, you long-eared, fur-bearing, flat-footed varmint! Ooh, you long-eared, fur-bearing, flat-footed varmint! <laughs> Is that what you tell people at your job? Oh, <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> As you mentioned before, when Sam is outside, he realizes, oh, he has to then, I guess, swim through the air to get back to the plane. And Bugs is like, I can't use any today. Try again next Wednesday. And he just closes, closes the door. <laughs> just. Sorry, can't use any today. Try next Wednesday. He doesn't care if Sam falls to his death, apparently. Like, he, Bugs really doesn't give a damn in this one, does he? I just, the more I think about it, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Compared to another, again, Bugs Bunny uh, airplane cartoon, the, the wartime one with the gremlin with uh, falling hair, where Bugs freaks out the whole time about the gremlin hijacking the plane and everything. This is kind of like how Bugs has evolved from being a flappable character to completely unflappable. You know, now he's completely in control. It's like, oh, OK, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In fact, Bugs is even singing a song. You're all for the big show tonight, so fly your wing to wing. Then I think that's a great segue, Manny. What song does Bugs sing, And Of course, it's time for... Time for a minute. Yeah, we get... <laughs> you like Krusty the Clown? You like Krusty's? They fight, they bind you. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get the picture. <laughs> I sang four performances this weekend, so I'm kind of beat. Before, what the hell was that? <laughs> what I was going to say before, uh, you were making another joke at my expense. First is hair lift. Then we're talking about falling hair. I mean, look, I get the point. I'm bald, you know. <laughs> you are? Well, the bit in that, that later, you know, 90s Bugs cartoon, they cut to Elmer Fudd in his trailer, Monoxidil Method. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely going to be me in a few weeks. <laughs> it's me forever. I mean, I'm bald, so I get Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you always got your 10-gallon hat on, you know, the hat that Homer wears. He says, just co go on, go about your business, ignore the hat or whatever he says. That's Matt all the time, trying yeah. to hide the fact he's bald. <laughs> with his 10-gallon his hat, you know, talking like, I don't know, the rich <laughs> Texan. <laughs> hey, Maverick! <laughs> and here I am just brushing my hair while you guys are talking about not having any. So there you go. All right. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Where did you guys go? Where did you guys go? But uh, Manny, what music do we hear in this one? Okay, so we hear a few things. We hear some popular music cues and we hear some classical. So, of course, we have the merry-go-round breakdown, the Looney Tunes theme. You hear Captain of the Clouds, what an appropriate song by Harry Arlen and Johnny Mercer. You hear a little bit. This one actually plays for about a minute or so. But you hear the overture to, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but Athalie, A-T-H-A-L-E-I by Felix Mendelssohn, and I always tell people, if you don't know Mendelssohn, that's the guy who wrote The Wedding March. And it's also the guy who did, the, speaking of Warner Brothers cartoons, he wrote On the Hebrides or Fingal's Cave, think of the minor bird from the Inky cartoons. Da -da 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 -da. Same composer. Got a little bit of Raymond Scott here. Reckless Night on Board an Ocean Liner. You hear that one for about 16 seconds in the cartoon. And this last cue, I didn't even notice it until I read the cue sheet. And it's only because it's five seconds long. But you hear a tiny bit of the overture to the opera Tenhäuser by Richard Wagner, which is one of absolutely gorgeous piece of music. And if you're asking me right now, Manny, what the heck is Tenhäuser? Think of what's opera doc. Ba 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 da da. So that thing right there. Well, that's also the Pilgrim's Chorus from the same opera. But yeah, you got two Romantic period composers in Mendelssohn and Wagner, and good old Raymond Scott and Johnny Mercer, Harry Arlen. So like a nice eclectic mix. But there's not too many cues in this cartoon. In total, there's about five. Wow, today between this cartoon that we're recording right now, we also did the commentary for 
Rabbit seasoning? There's not a lot of cues today. I'm so used to like recording a 15 hour long dissertation or whatever for the earlier Warner Brothers shorts, which you should go listen to because I put a lot of work into it. So does Ham. But you know, some good choices, but I didn't really hear them pop out as much. I think I need to do another watch of this cartoon and really pay attention to these cues because you could say for better or for better, they're not as obvious as other cartoons where the cues just like really stand out to you. As we finish this cartoon, we've got the rope pilot, as I mentioned before, classic, I absolutely love that. And Sam takes the other parachute and in a beautiful bit of plot convenience, he lands in the police car that just happens to be there at that specific moment. And since when do police cars have open tops? So it's nice and convenient there. And the ending is like the ending gag with Fallen Hair where the plane just stops. And, in midair. <laughs> in the midair, and that's pretty much it. I'm surprised, Anthony, that you did not mention the absolute gem of a dad joke at the end of this cartoon, because that's your bread and butter right there. Hey, good thing this thing had air brakes. And I'm just like, Anthony must be grinning like the Cheshire cat at that pun. Like, literally, I'm just like, Oh, I got to do this for Anthony. Chef's kiss for that dad joke. Well, dad joke circa 1952, but, you know. Oh, I was just waiting for you to mention that because, you know, I clearly didn't forget about it, right? Uh, well, and it holds up, though, better than the joke at the end of Falling Hair, which is essentially the same gag, except in that one he says, Well, you know how it is with these A cards. how it is with these A-cards. And of course, nobody now gets that, really. It was a World War II reference about gas rationing, but people are like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, well, I don't really get that, but they get the, the air brakes joke. That's right. So, Everyone I'm, loves dad jokes. Must... I mean, if they ended that cartoon just like when the gremlin goes, sorry, folks, we ran out of gas, it would have gotten the point across. That yeah. joke would have still held up but yeah i mean for us nerds in warner brothers history we get all these world war ii references but i would watch the ending and i'm just like okay the plane ran out of gas and i never paid any mind to that final line i'm just like a card c card i'm like well those are letters okay cool it's still a cool card <laughs> yeah i know letters yeah <laughs> I know letters. I'm a musician i only use seven of them <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> everything yeah. Lucky for me, this thing had air brakes. So in terms of a score, I'm going to say this one was a nice little pleasant surprise. I mean, it's not going to be, I think, a go too short. I don't think it'll end up being like that for me. But that's why I like doing this. I get to dis discover or rediscover, whatever you want to call it, some of these shorts that I never really watched before. Or if I have, I never really pay much, much attention to it. But this one gets, I don't know, 8.5 out of 10. It's, it's solid. It's funny. It's even funnier when you look at all the logistic plot whole parts in this one with no security and all that stuff but as a cartoon itself yeah it's pretty funny yeah eight and a half i'd say nine yeah, i mean i enjoyed it maybe i didn't enjoy it as much as you guys i thought it was all right but it's still pretty funny i'd give it i was gonna say seven and a half but i don't want to be that mean i'll give it an eight eight out of ten okay but it would have been eight and a half if it wasn't for the dad joke at the end right if it had more dad jokes it would have been a ten so <laughs> that's right. It would have been better than what's opera doc and all those sort of masterpieces. Oh, of course. It's like all those masterpieces. Get out of here. Just give me seven minutes of bugs and Sam doing dad jokes. We're on easy street. Yeah. It makes you wish that takes every director that bugs and Daffy sure way. But as a spot cat cartoon, you know, we can <laughs> have nothing but dad jokes. But in any case, that'll do it for this one. Thanks so much for watching guys. And until next time, take care. My hair has done plenty of lifting and falling for one day or for one lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Before, what the hell was that? that? <laughs> Lucky for me, this thing had air brakes.